sing, come all you weary, come all you thirsty. And come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come on. And come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved, for God so loved the world that he gave us. His one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Won't you turn to somebody either on your left or right and tell them, I'm glad you're in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Sing, bring all your failures. Now bring all your failures. Bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. See his open arms. Come on, church. For God so loved the world that he gave us. His one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Power of hell defeated. For God so loved, God so loved the world. Oh, we'll sing praise God. Come on, church, sing it together. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Hey. God, for God so loved the world that He gave us His one. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Hell's defeated, come on, lift your voice. The power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well, I'm walking in freedom for God. failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting god so loved the world you are god's faithful amen we'll sing about that this morning sing with me i count on one thing i count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now. He won't fail me now and in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high. In the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my 
heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Church, we're going to sing those words again. I count on one thing. on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now and in the waiting oh he's never late the same God who's never late is working all things out working all things out yes I will oh yes I will lift you high the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will, and I choose to pray. the name of all names that nothing can stand against and not choose to praise glorify glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against oh yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will bless your name We're going to continue to sing, worship the King of Kings. Miss Laney's going to lead us in this next song.
song. Come on, church. Just our voices. We will praise the Good morning again, church. Take your Bibles if you've brought them and turn with me, if you would, uh, to Psalm chapter 85. Psalm chapter 85. While you're finding your place there, because I'll forget if I don't say it now, I want to apologize in advance uh, for what I'm going to do as soon as the service is over. Normally, I hang out in the lobby till the biggest majority of you are gone off to eat. Uh, some good Mexican food, because that's what Christians do. Um, but this morning, I will not be able to do that. I'm traveling to Missouri uh, for a funeral that begins at 3 o'clock. And so whenever I get done, I'm not being rude. I've just got, I've got to hit the road going. Uh, so I won't be in the lobby uh, to greet you this afternoon. And, but I appreciate your prayers for me as I travel uh, and, and so grateful for that. And by the way, what a crowd today and last week for spring break Sundays. Uh, where I come from in Missouri, we don't, we don't have spring break up there. Um, that just, I, I don't know whether it was because of snow days or what, but I did, we just didn't have it. So I moved down here, and I remember my first couple of years here as your pastor and spring break hit, and hit you on the, the first Sunday and the last one, and it was a ghost town in this place. I'm like, where did everybody go? And y'all were at the beach. That's where the, everybody went. Um, but last week, because uh, I, I prepared myself for this, I'm like, well, it may just be, you know, just a handful of us. And this the place was packed, and look at it again today. Uh, so thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, coming and worshiping with us. Um, do you ever feel like that you had a really good plan until you told it to the Lord and then found out that it was your plan and not his and he redirected it. Um, this was one of the things I struggled with early on in ministry because all I knew was topical preaching, which means you, you have an idea, a thought, a subject, and then you go find what scriptures you want to use to kind of you know, hang on to that. Um, and then you, you preach, you just get up and clear off a spot and throw a fit. Um, well, I, I transitioned from that. I had some men that invested in me and said, no, you really need to do expositional preaching and you really need to preach through books of the Bible. And I just thought, man, how boring, how, how would that be? And you, you always know, uh, you know, you, you just go to the next page, you know, the next text. And I just thought that'd be the most boring thing in the world. I don't know why I thought that because I remember those Saturday night late begging God, please say something, Lord, uh, in those early days of ministry because inevitably when you're doing just topical preaching, you wind up just thumbing through the Bible going, I hope he says, well, he did say something. We've got a whole book of what he said, but I, I made that transition. However, one of my concerns was, well, are you taking out the Holy Spirit's guidance if you just always know where you're going, I, I need to know he's led me that way. And so one of the things I committed early on in that is, Lord, I'm going to preach through books of the Bible. And so that's what I've been doing for the last 20 plus years. Uh, but I made the commitment that, Lord, if, there's, if I ever I'm moving on to a text that you want to divert my attention elsewhere, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, and he did that. I was preparing. I had prepared my message in John chapter uh, something four um, and uh, ready to roll. And then he, we, we detoured this week. And so this week, 
We're going to be looking at Psalm 85, and I'm not even walking through all of them. I'm going to read it because it's just, it's beautiful how it's written. Um, but I, I want to talk on this subject, the revival road, the revival road. How many of you know, it doesn't matter where you are going. If you're on the wrong, this boy, this is deep. If you're on the wrong road, you ain't going to get there. Now, that's some Thomas Holler wisdom right there. Amen. It doesn't matter where you're going. If you're on the wrong road, you ain't going to get there. All right. It, revival's a lot that way. There's a lot of folks when we talk about revival in the life of a church or in the life of an individual or even bit bigger in life of a denomination that they, they talk as though that they desire it. They love to experience it or many would just like to see it. The problem is, is they're on the wrong road. They're on the wrong path to get there. It's not going to come through gimmicks. It's not going to come through uh, 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 personalities. It's not going to come if we sing just the right song or get the temperature in the room just right. Lord knows we can't do that. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's just never going to happen through there. However, I believe that the Bible gives us a really um, definitive picture of what it is that would help us get on the, the right road to position ourselves to experience what we would know to be as revival. And so let me read this text to you, uh, Psalm 85. It, the, the superscript says, it's a prayer that the Lord would re will restore favor to the land. Uh, it's a psalm of the sons of Korah. It says in this, in verse one, Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You've brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin, Selah. You've taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace. He'll speak peace to his people and to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. That's a good one, amen? Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make, now would you listen to this, and shall make his footsteps our pathway. His footsteps our pathway. Lord, may you bless the reading and the preaching of your word for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want you to notice quickly all of these different statements that the sons of Korah have written here about the Lord. They said he's favorable. They said he brought them back from captivity. They said he had forgiven them. He had covered their sin. He'd taken away his wrath. He would turned from the fierceness of his anger. That makes us nervous about that kind of God. Why? Because I, the kind of God we really want in our culture is the, 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 the sweet, mild, meek, and fluffy God. We, 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 don't, we, we don't like the God that's, that's anger, the one that has a fierceness or a wrath. Listen to me, you can't take him as a holy God and but yet not also take him as a wrathful God. The Bible declares very clearly he is a God of wrath. Why? Because sin must be punished, that's why. Sin must be dealt with. That he restores us. He, he ceased in his anger toward us. He revives us. He gives mercy. He grants us salvation. He speaks peace. He gives us what is good. Are you anybody blessed yet? These are all what they are declaring. These are the things our God does for his people. But this last statement just got a hold of me. His footsteps, our pathway. Now I grew up 
a, a coon hunter. Raise your hand if you've been coon hunting before. Hey, men, good number of you. The rest of you ought to go coon hunting. Well, as a boy, coon hunting, one of the things that, that I, I learned very early on, especially uh, in the spring of the year, that there was one thing that really battled against being a uh, vertically challenged boy, and that was a thing called dew. D-E-W, dew. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Dew. It had drowned a short little boy. Y'all hearing me? We'd cut them dogs out down a creek somewhere and they'd go chase this coon and we gotta go in there to get them. They're treed. And then we'd head off across this field that'd have grass and weeds taller than I was and it's just covered with dew, okay? I mean, I'm talking about just covered with it. And by the time I'd get in there to the tree, I'd look like I'd been swimming, not coon hunting. Y'all understand what I'm saying? But I learned a little trick that saved me a lot of grief and kept me at least somewhat more dry. And that was all I had to do was allow my dad's footsteps to be my pathway. Everywhere he went, he mashed down more grass than I mashed down, amen? He, 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 he made a, a bigger path than I did. All I did was make a trail through the dew, but he knocked down the weeds. And so I learned now, his stride was longer than mine was, so sometimes I had to really get out there and stretch. But if I'd work at it, what would happen, all I'd have to do is put my feet where his feet went, and it was the safest, the most prosperous trip I could take in there to get them silly dogs. I thought about that. Isn't that silly, though, how, how God brings back things from your childhood? I thought about that this week as I read this one statement, and he shall make his footsteps our pathway. The picture that the sons of Korah are giving us is that you can trust the footsteps of the Lord. Wherever it is that he leads, he is a trustworthy God. And sometimes when it comes to the issue of revival, we get all the way up there to where we see the footsteps. We begin to count the cost. Oh, this is going to cost us. We can't continue on like we were. By the way, if you could continue on like you were and experience revival, you'd already be experiencing it. It's not the definition of, what is it, lunacy? To keep doing the same things over and over and expect a different results. Anybody ever heard that? I didn't make it up. Amen. Y'all heard that? This is kind of how we often approach what it is to experience revival. Now, the word revival, interesting. So let me kind of deal with that before we, we jump in here further. Uh, it really just means to, to, to bring back to life. Like this, this, I'm really kind of focused here today. Verse 6, will you revi not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. The, the word revive there is the Hebrew word haya, okay? Uh, haya. Um, I said that 32 times in my office this week, haya. Because um, I think of, this is my little ADD immature. So, as soon as I say that out loud, I'm like, I'm thinking about Judy chopping something, amen. Haya, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I just, anyway. That's the Hebrew word that he's using, and it just it means to bring back life into something, to, to, to breathe life back into that which was dying or not as alive as it once was. So now think with me about the, what the psalmist is saying. Lord, would you not revive us again that our people would rejoice in you. Some would, would, would bark about revival and say, well, I just, you know, it's kind of an antiquated thing and, and we need something else because revivals don't last. The sons of Korah understood that that wasn't necessarily a lasting thing. Why did they say, God, revive us again? They knew they needed to come back to the well. By the way, your showers don't last either, but you're not griping about them. You're getting back in that thing every day. Amen. All right, then you need to start getting back in that every day. Amen? That wasn't a trick question. You should bathe. Oh, I can't believe I'm saying that. It's what a pastor does. He just covers it all. Shower daily, okay? But you need revival daily. You, you, you really do. So let me, let me give you some ideas here of 
what it is to be walking on the revival road. Number one, I want you to talk, I want to talk to you about the, our prayer for revival. Here's a, here's a truth, a, just a bedrock truth. No revival, movement of God, awakening that has ever taken place in the history of mankind has been void of prayer. None, zero. All movements of God are, are unique. They, they have a, a different twist a little bit um, uh, of them. They're unique to the people. They're unique to the setting. But none of them are without preceding and prevailing prayer. Prayer of God's people come coming to confess, prayer of God's people coming to praise him, prayer of God's people come and will always, this is always a component of it, praying for the lost, praying that God would reach their neighbors, their family members, classmates, co-workers, they would pray. Psalm 85, four here says, restore us, O God of our salvation and cause your anger toward us to cease. It is a prayer of of repentance. God, we understand. We deserve all of the anger you would give to us, but God, we pray that you would revive us, restore us, so that we would not just not experience your wrath, we would experience your grace. Church, if we want to experience revival, a a fresh movement of the Spirit of God in this place, we're going to have to start being a people that pray again. Now, can I... Can I quit beating around the bush a little bit and just shoot straight with you without y'all getting fussy? Uh, here's, what, here's kind of where we are in, in our praying often. Um, we, we, we really are a people that have, have gotten accustomed to popcorn prayers. We like, you know what, popcorn prayers. You just kind of just, you say them. And there's a place for those. But what we, what we struggle with, we struggle with corporate prayer. We struggle with uh, prevailing prayer. We, we struggle with what it is to gather and, and pray. You, you'll see this every week, and I'll give an invitation. Every week, I'll give an invitation. And without uh, fail, every week, here's what I'm saying to you. I'm saying to every, listen to me, not select group, not those that want to. I'm saying to every single born-again Christian in the room, I'm inviting you, hey, let's come gather and pray. Now, here's what will happen. There's a significant number of people that actually do come. But that significant number, probably about 25% of us, every week, about 25% of us will come, maybe, that's on a good day, and and, and pray. Now, I I, I know all the pushback on that. I get it. Well, you don't have to go up there to pray. I get that. You you can pray anywhere. You you can pray while you were taking that shower that you skipped. Amen. Uh, He he hears us in water. Amen. Amen. But here's a time that we set aside every week for us to corporately come together and pray. A couple of things. One, we're praying in response to what we've just heard. That, that's part of why we're coming. That's why I'm inviting you. Hey, let's, let's pray in response to what we've heard. God, I've just heard your word declared. What would you say to me? God, what would you have me to do? And so we're doing that as a way of saying, hey, I, we're in this together. This is an individual time. This is an individual time for us to, to praise and worship. It, it's, it's corporate. That's why we're together. Your individual time is when you're alone in your prayer closet. And so I'm inviting this. And I've, I've declared this to you for years and years, and I, I, I believe it as much today as I ever have. If there's lost people in our community, and I'm just going to go on a limb and say y'all would agree with me that everybody in our community is not yet saved. If you don't believe that, go to Walmart this afternoon. You'll come back and say, sure enough, they ain't saved. If there's lost people in our communities, we ought to be fighting for a place to come up here and kneel and gather and corporately pray together. Why? Because here's what it's going to demonstrate. It's going to demonstrate we're desperate to see God use us to reach our neighbor with the gospel. It, It ought to be a place where we weep over the lost. It ought to be a place where we cry out to God, oh God, that you would use us to impact our community, the lostness in our community with the gospel. We're not gonna see revival if we don't become a people of prayer. Furthermore, here's another component of that. We all wanna see lost people saved. I I, I know you you want that. And here's often what we're saying. Hey, I'd love for them to come walk an aisle and 
tell the preacher, I want to be saved. That'd be awesome. Here, here's a question to you. Why would we expect lost people to do what the church quit doing years ago? They ought to be able to follow us. They ought to be able to see an example of us saying, hey, that's a good place to go. Let's go seek God together. Our prayer for revival must be prevalent. I want you to notice, secondly, God's power for revival. God's power. He is the only one that has the power for revival. No preacher can do that. I can't give that to you. If I could, I'm telling you, I'd double dose all of you. Matter of fact, I'd have a, a mister of some kind on the doors, and we'd, just, we'd spray you on the way in and get it all over you, amen? Like an old cow coming through a rub. See, some of y'all ain't country enough to know what I just said. Okay, if you want to get all the flies off your cow's back, you put an old rub up between two trees and make it to where she goes through there. I'd put up a revival rub for you. Psalm 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. What's the psalmist saying? He's saying we're not trusting in anything but the Lord for our salvation. We're not trusting in Rome. We're not trusting in, in, in the kings. We're not trusting in the, the masses of our people. And for us, we're not trusting in our facilities. We're not trusting in our name. We're not trusting in the Southern Baptist Convention. And we, we're sure not trusting in our preacher. We are trusting in the Lord for a movement of God. It's a picture that happened in 1 Kings something, 18. Is that where Elijah in the, anyway, it's in there. I think it's 18. And here he is with the prophets of Baal. Y'all remember this story? And, and they're, they're having a fuss over who's, who's the real God. It's Baal or it's, it's, it's the God of the Bible. It's Baal or it's Jehovah. And, and, and Elijah tells them, build an altar, put a bull on there, Call down fire from heaven. Whatever God answers by fire, that's God, okay? So they start doing all this goofy stuff. They're yelling and hollering, and, and then they start cutting themselves. It's a thing called asceticism. In other words, that if you will hurt yourself enough, if you will suffer enough, God will have to answer you. What were they doing? They were trying to use gimmicks to get God in their mind to move. Listen to me. Gimmicks never have, nor will they ever work at moving the hand of God. They just don't, amen on that? They just don't work. Gimmicks will not. Now, you may make headlines with some gimmicks. You, you may get some social media followers with some gimmicks. You may even get a bigger crowd with some gimmicks, but you will not experience a movement of God in terms of revival through gimmicks. It is the power of God that we need, not the power of gimmicks. It's the power of God. Number three, I need you to know of our position for revival. I want you to turn over with me, if you would, the very familiar verse in the scriptures in 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14. It tells us about our position for revival. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. I'll read the whole verse to you here while you're getting there and I'm gonna show you a component of it. It says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and, they, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land and heal their land. Our only position that we can receive revival in is this, it's humility. It's humility. Listen to the text, the beginning of it. If my people who are called by my name will what? Humble themselves. Humble themselves. The reality is either you can humble yourself or God can. I promise you, it's better if you humble yourself rather than God. What, what, what it's doing is humbling ourselves is coming to a place where we begin to agree with God about our own condition. But what do we do often with our condition? We, we smack our chest and say, well, I'm not as bad as her. I'm not as bad as him. And, and all we've got to do is compare to somebody else. Because here's the facts. All of us can find somebody else that we can out-Christian. Is that right? I mean, Let's, let's just do a little field trip here. Look around the room. 
Go ahead. Everybody just turn around. Some of you are like, this is a trick. No, it ain't. You find somebody else in there. Look around. Somebody's a worse sinner than you. Find them. Don't call them out. Don't point at them. Just, you know, eyeball them. Now, if you're sitting in here and think everybody's looking at you, that, that's the Lord, okay? Uh, I'm messing with you. I just make sure you're still awake. We all have somebody that we, we use as a standard to say, well, I ain't as bad as they are. Here's, here's the interesting part. Never in your Bible, if the Bible is our authority, and by the way, it is, never will he, we find this place where he's saying, hey, make sure you're out doing the, mm, them. You, you Republicans, be sure you, you know, out-Christian the Democrats, and you Democrats, be sure and out-Christian the, the Republicans. It's just not there. What we find is there is a standard. That standard is holiness. That standard is Jesus Christ. And what he's pointing us to here is when we understand that that's the standard, all of us have to come to a place of agreement with God. I'm not meeting the standard. Therefore, God, I humbly come and confess I'm a sinner. I humbly come and pour myself out before. God, I, I humbly come and beg of you. Oh God, don't give me your wrath. Give me your grace. Number next, I want you to know what God's plan for revival is. It's in the same verse. How do we experience it? He said, humble yourselves, pray and seek my face, my face, why is that important? Because most often when we pray, we're seeking his hand and not his face. I don't have time to fully unpack that for you. But I think if you think about it, you can, get, you can catch on where I'm headed. His hand is what we want from deliverance and blessing and, oh, God, bless this and fix that. And if you could hold. Imagine all the prayers he gets about weather. Amen. Just imagine all the prayers. I thought about that the other day. Somebody said something to me, asked me if I would pray. I don't even remember who it was. It doesn't matter. If, if I would pray about the weather, and I said, no. No, I'm, I'm not. But why? Because th th we, we pray thinking about our own situation. Well, we, we've got a, you know, I've got a, a ball game I'm wanting to go to. And it, we can't have it rain out that ball game. But, but what about the farmer that's praying for rain that really badly needs it? which one's more important? And I know what you're going to say. Well, the ball game, he can brain after the game's over. <laughs> How many of us are guilty of it? I am. I've done it. Okay, I'm the only one. Oh, <laughs> praise the Lord. Okay, what are, we, what are we doing? We're asking for his hand. We want his hand. Running out of money before I'm, I'm, I'm running out of, of week. Oh, God, I need your hand. Bring me some more cash. Things are hard at work this week. My boss is nagging me. God, like you shut the mouths of the lions, shut him up. What are you wanting? You're wanting his hand. You want his hand. Close relative is sick with cancer. Oh God, heal. Should we still pray for healing? Absolutely. He's still a healing God. He's Jehovah Rapha. He is the God that heals. You, absolutely. But listen to me. It's his hand. And there's nothing wrong with praying for his hand. But that's not the plan of revival is to just get the hand of God moving again. Get the hand of God to bring about a miracle. Listen to it again. And we pray, would pray and seek his face. Not that we're wanting you to do something. That we would see you do something. God, that we would know you. God, that we would know you more, that intimately, God, we would be connected to you. Oh, God, have us, help us to have your heart. Help us to see the world like you see the world. Help us to see ourselves like you see ourselves. Humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and listen to it, and turn from their wicked ways. This is God's plan for revival. What he's calling them to do is to remove the rubbish, the, the junk from their lives. If we're expecting to see a revival that is genuine, Holy Ghost, heaven sent, devil killing, 
kind of revival, we've got to be a people that get, again, serious about our own stinking sin. We can't play it off as trivial any longer. We can't play it off as though we're better than somebody else any longer. If we take it as serious as God takes it, we will get desperate before him, begin to cry out and pray to him and say, oh God, lest you show up, I am hopelessly undone. Last thing, what's the purpose of it? What is God's purpose for revival? I find it back in Psalm 85, six. Look back there with me and then we'll pray. He said, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? That's the purpose. Revive us again that your people would rejoice in you in you. Rejoice in the Lord. You remember how Paul said it in his, in his, his letters in the New Testament? He said, rejoice in the, to the uh, Philippian church. Rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. He said, I'm going to say it again. Rejoice in the Lord. There, there's a powerful thing that takes place when God's people begin to rejoice in him. Please understand, the context is our most powerful moments of rejoicing happens when we may not be experiencing his hand. I bet old Paul would have loved to have had the hand of the Lord move when he was there in that prison writing that. Man, turn me loose. You've set Peter loose. Matter of fact, you've set me loose before. Do it again, Lord. Move your hand. That's not what he prayed for. He prayed that, oh God, you would grant me boldness that I would speak as I ought to speak. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'll say rejoice. God, would you not revive us again that your people would rejoice in you? It's the picture, it is a picture of the prodigal son. You remember this in in, in Luke's gospel? Uh, The the prodigal son, he went to his daddy. He punk kids what he was. He said, daddy, I need, he probably said more like, yo, pops. I, I want my cut. I want my cut. Well, son, that's not how it works. I want my cut. He give it to him. He runs off and he wastes it all. Wastes it all. Now, the dad could have refused him. The dad could have uh, chased him down, made sure that he, you know, was being smart and, you know, living according to his budget, you know. But he didn't even let him go. He had free will. The Bible says while he sat in the hog pen, which was an interesting place for a young Jewish boy to be, it said he, I love this statement, he came to himself. Did you, this is free, I hadn't planned on saying this, but I think it's good. Did you know sin will make you stupid? Anybody know that? Man, I'm telling you, I've experienced that. If I was to write a book, I could write a book on the stupidity of sin not written by yours truly, but experienced by yours truly. It'll make you stupid. The Bible says he came to himself. What's that declaring? It's declaring he wasn't being himself. He wasn't acting in his right mind. He was acting out his mind. He was, an, he was acting a fool. He was acting as an idiot. Man, what a candidate for revival. But, but, but had he ever stopped being a son? No. He was a son all the way through that. But he came to himself. And you know what he did? He returned. You know what that word return is? Old Testament, it's the word shub. In the New Testament, it's just given this picture of, I, I, I'm not staying here. I'm turning back. I'm, I'm going back. And it wasn't just that he was getting away from the hog pen. He understood, I've got to get back to the Father. At the Father's feet's where it's going to be good. And so he takes off, and then this picture is, is, is given to us that I just think so often is missed. The Father sees him off at a distance, and because here's what I'd have been doing. I'd have been up there. I can't, I can't tap that toe. I'd have been up, up there tapping my toe going, you little nasty punk, I'm going to give it to you. Anybody else? Bless God, he's got it coming. Little worm, just come take my money. Get on up here and let him grab, you know, 
Just, why are y'all judging me? Y'all, oh no, I'd be just like the father and just go love him and kill a calf for him. I bet most of y'all wouldn't. Most of us going to give some tough love, amen, tough love. That wasn't the picture of the father. The father sees him at a distance and the father scoots out running after him. The Bible says that he fell on his neck. Now, the word fall doesn't mean he tripped and fell on him. It means that he, when he caught up, to, he embraced him and he kissed him on the neck and he says, welcome home, my son. Oh, welcome home. My son that was lost is now found. And he goes out and they had a barbecue. Amen. There ain't nothing just says rejoicing like a barbecue. Amen. Let's kill that old heifer over there and eat her. And he put a ring on his finger and he put a robe on his back. And they threw a, oh, they threw a party. Now, I ain't got time to get into the elder brother because there's always going to be somebody sitting around mad. Well, I didn't leave West God. Yeah, you did a long time ago. You're sour. But the picture, the picture of this is, Lord, would you revive us that we would rejoice in you? You see, there's power in rejoicing. There's power in praise. There's power when God's people recognize the goodness of the Father and say, I just got to get back. Whatever it takes, I got to get back. Because here's what he said, I'll go be a slave, not a son. And what he found is what you'll find when you come back to the Father. The Father that's saying, welcome home. Not one tapping his toe, not one looking down his nose, not one sitting there with anger and folded arms, but one with outstretched arms saying, welcome home, been looking for you, won't you come in? Some of you probably need to come home today. Some of you today may need to become a son or a daughter today by trusting in Christ's finished work on the cross. And I want to give you opportunity and invite you to make that decision today. So there where you are, if you would value.